for people unfamiliar with you, if you would please just tell us your name and a little bit about your background and really what you've been doing for the last 20 years or so. My name is Ocean Robbins, and I am co-founder and CEO of Food Revolution Network. And my mission is healthy, ethical, and sustainable food for all. I want to see a world where every kid is taken off the fast track to diabetes and obesity. I want to see a world where our elders can grow, it can age with, and step into their wisdom years with peace and ease and joy and a clear mind. I want to see a world where all of us, regardless of the color of our skin or how much money we have in the bank, has healthy food for our families. Your book, 31 Day Food Revolution, Heal Your Body, Feel Great and Transform Your World, what is that all about? I wrote 31 Day Food Revolution because I'm sick and tired of so many people being sick and tired. I think that we're fed up with the toxic food system and we're hungry for a change and I want to give the power to create that change into your hands where it belongs. For so many people, the biggest challenge isn't even knowing what to do, it's doing what we know. If, if all that was needed was to say, hey, we need to eat more fruits and vegetables and less processed junk, we wouldn't have an obesity epidemic in America right now. But unfortunately, just knowledge isn't enough. We also need action because at the end of the day, cancer doesn't care a heck of a lot how many videos you watch, how many books you read, how many podcasts you listen to. It does care what you eat and how you live. And if you want to fight cancer and heart disease and type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's, the prescription fundamentally is the same. And it's not some newfangled drug. It's good, wholesome, healthy food. So I wrote 31 Day Food Revolution with 31 chapters, each of which ends with simple action steps you can take to put into action what you're learning and get results in your life. Where does all the animal waste go and what impact does that have on, on dead zones and waterways and the environment? It takes about 12 pounds of grain to produce one pound of feedlot beef in modern factory farms. For chicken or pork or eggs, it's a little bit less inefficient, but we still essentially have a protein factory in reverse. We're taking soy and corn and uh, irrigated pasture land and we're turning it into uh, livestock flesh and we're wasting most of the resources in the process and we're turning them into hoof and hide and bones and energy the animals use and most of all, manure. And all that manure has to go somewhere. Now in the old days, an animal would poop on the ground and their manure would turn into fertilizer for the next generation of plants. But nowadays, when you concentrate a huge amount of animals in a very small space, that manure actually becomes a problem. It concentrates into these huge lagoons that become a source of immense uh, pollution to the community. Uh, it's causing asthma. Uh, it's one of the primary drivers of asthma in America right now is people living in communities near these factory farms that are actually breathing polluted air that's uh, causing lung problems. It's also contaminating the water. Nitrates are seeping down into the drinking water and uh, causing all kinds of health problems for, for humanity. Uh, now, some of that manure is still being composted and recycled, but along the way, it stores up in these huge quantities and causes massive problems. So, uh, you know, if you care about the future of clean water, if you care about wanting food for future generations and you don't want to see us wasting all these calories going into livestock, if you care about our climate because you want to see forests instead of cropland, then uh, you know what? Eat less meat. What impact does eating animal products have on climate change and how does eating a hamburger affect climate change? The UN Food and Agriculture Organization looked at the impact of many different factors, but particularly they, they looked at uh, agriculture and its impact on climate. They ended up determining that cows impact our climate even more than cars do. It's pretty tremendous. Um, and th the reason is c cows have a lot of factors. It's not because they stay up all night with the lights on or because, you know, they, they forget to turn the heat down when they leave the room. It's because livestock is very intensive on agricultural resources. It takes 12 pounds of grain to produce one pound of feedlot beef in the modern factory farming system. Uh, when cows are grazing, often they're grazing on land that used to be forest. It takes a lot of land to sustainably graze cattle, and all that land has to come from somewhere. So when you look at all the factors, and also the fact that meat has to be refrigerated, and that it's highly perishable, and you look at all the resources that go into meat production, uh, you end up determining that if you want to uh, eat a more plant-based diet, that may be the most powerful single step you can take as an individual consumer to help slow or stop 
climate change. As a matter of fact, if, um, if there was a study done that found that a Prius driver who ate a standard American diet would have a bigger carbon footprint than a Hummer driver who was vegan. So whether you go vegan or not, there's a lot of room to eat less meat and make a big difference for the planet. What's wrong with fish farms? We've heard a lot about the environmental and health problems that come from factory farms where we coop animals together in terribly unnatural conditions and pump them full of antibiotics just to keep them alive and feed them a totally unnatural diet and get a terrible feed conversion ratio. Well, guess what? All of that is happening with fish right now. It takes about five pounds of fish from the oceans to produce one pound of farm fish. The other four are essentially wasted or turned into pollution. Fish farms are massively polluted. The fish fecal material is, there's basically swimming in it. There's nowhere for it to go because they're so con contaminated and concentrated. Uh, they, they are given antibiotics to keep them alive under these conditions. Salmon farms are actually uh, giving the salmon dye, food coloring, that is in the water they're swimming in so that their flesh will be pink because otherwise they're fed a very unnatural diet and their flesh would be gray. Well, people don't want gray salmon because they want it to be salmon colored. So the industry gives them dyes to make that happen. Uh, it's a, it's a, a violation of nature and the way these, these creatures were actually, I think, meant to live. Now, that said, there are some fish farms that are trying to do the right thing and uh, trying to figure out how to raise food sustainably in the oceans. And I think that's worth pursuing, but we have to keep our eyes open and be sober to the fact that most modern fish is coming from farms where the fish were treated terribly and they're environmental disasters. How does eating fish affect climate change and cause natural resource shortages? Because it takes about five pounds of fish meal to make one pound of farmed fish, fish farming is not an answer to the dem demolition of the oceans that we see taking place today as we're strip mining them for wild fish. It's actually uh, probably making the problem worse. Fish farms um, are also resource intensive and wasteful and polluting. And this is bad for our climate and it also creates an inferior product because farmed fish, whatever nutritional benefits we see in fish are worse and the pollution is higher. Fish farms create fish that are much higher in PCBs and heavy metals and mercury and other toxins that we're already getting too much of. Why should people care about the way animals raised to be food are treated? There's something profound and even magical about the human-animal bond. Anyone who's ever had a dog or a cat that they fell in love with knows what I'm talking about. It somehow deepens our own sense of humanity to communicate and connect across the species line and to feel the unconditional love that animals are capable of. We have, I think, some kind of responsibility towards the animals in our lives to be stewards, to care for them, to look out for them. And tragically, I think that the factory farming system is a total violation of that bond. Um, I, I don't know anybody who wants to see animals treated cruelly. In fact, 94% of the American public says that animals who are raised for food, if animals are going to be raised for food at all, should be treated uh, humanely and free from cruelty. And yet, the modern factory farming system has institutionalized levels of cruelty that literally, if you or I did them to a dog or a cat, we would go to jail. But it's normalized and the laws are such, in every state we've got laws against cruelty to animals, but in every state they specifically exempt animals raised for food so long as the practice is normal. So now we've got a system where normal is in incredibly, and I would say unconscionably, cruel. We've got chickens being housed in warehouses so small they cannot lift a single wing. They are so packed together with 5, 10, 15, 20,000 birds under one roof sitting in their own feces and the feces of generations of chickens before them, bred to be morbidly obese so that they cannot even stand. They lie in poop, their feathers fall off, 5% of them die before they even reach slaughter. And this is normal. And I don't know anyone who thinks it's okay. So personally, I don't want to eat the products of a system like that, which are very contaminated, by the way. There's a reason why 80% of the chicken meat in our supermarkets is contaminated with E. coli, pathogenic bacteria, because the birds sat in poop their whole lives. This is not the way that nature designed it to be, and I don't think it's uh, what our, we as humans want for our impact on other species. So, you know, I think people who eat meat, uh, even people who eat meat, maybe especially people who eat meat, want animals to be free from this kind of
cruelty. We all have a stake in saying enough is enough. Animals deserve to be treated with respect. They deserve to good, live good lives. Whether or not you choose to eat animal flesh, there's a lot of factors that go into that decision. I think a lot of us could agree we should not be treating animals this way. Do factory farms still exist or have they gotten any better? There's been a lot of marketing hype around free range, grass fed, pasture raised, cage free meat and animal products. So much so that a lot of people think that the factory farming system is dead. Well, I got news for you, it's not. In fact, if anything, it hasn't changed hardly at all, and it may have even gotten a little bit worse. We do have some uh, animal welfare laws that have kicked in that have banned some of the most egregious things, like gestational crates from other pigs, where they were kept unable to suckle their young and unable to stand for six months at a time while they were in the late stages of pregnancy and nursing. But, but um, for the most part, things have not improved. What we've got today is um, actually laws in many states that keep, uh, make it illegal to take pictures of factory farms. So you could literally go to jail just for taking a picture. They're not trying to stop us from taking pictures of broccoli farms, by the way. It's because they don't want us to know what's really going on and see it for real. But this is what's happening. Uh, free range can be a step in the right direction, but unfortunately, like take, take chickens, for example. Uh, the, the industry gives the average chicken about one square foot per bird. Cage-free birds get about one and a half square feet. Free range means they get at least um, three square feet. Now, three square feet is, you know, a lot better than one, but it's not really, like, free. That, that chicken can still uh, not even necessarily lift its wings uh, and spread them. Wingspan is often three and a half feet. So this is pretty darn packed, if you ask me. And they don't necessarily ever see the sun or a blade of grass in their entire lives. Technically, to be free range, they have to have some door that's open to some paddocks, but it may be a little tiny six by six square outside that none of them ever go to because it's cold out. So I think that pasture raised actually means something, by the way. So if you are interested in humane treatment of animals, pasture raised means 108 square feet per bird, which is quite a bit different than one or two or three. Uh, and with, with meat production, we see uh, hormone-free and antibiotic-free or organic, and people assume that the animal lived a good life. But it actually doesn't mean that the animal lived a good life at all. It means it wasn't pumped full of hormones or antibiotics, and that it was ate feed that was grown organically. Those are all positive steps, but as somebody who wants a truly humane world, uh, I still want animals that, you know, birds aren't having their beaks cut off so they don't peck each other to death because they're driven crazy in bad conditions. I still want you know, uh, livestock to be able to walk around and see the sun and see grass. I think that animals need to live their basic lives and eat their, eat their natural diets. And for anybody who is going to eat animal products, let's at least move it in that direction. And a lot of us say no to the whole darn system and say, no, let's choose to be animal product free. And I think that's a wonderful choice for those who can make it. How are chickens treated that are raised to be chicken in supermarkets and restaurants and schools? A friend of mine is a man by the name of Craig Watts. He was a chicken farmer, and he um, had about 80,000 birds on his farm in several barns with like 20,000 birds each. And he worked for Purdue. He was a star producer. He won lots of awards. He did everything they said to do. They told him what kind of feed to give the chickens, what kind of facilities to keep them in, how to filter the air, everything. Uh, they forbid him from ever opening windows. It was built into his contract that they couldn't see the natural light or have fresh air because it would cause them to move around more and that would be bad for feed conversion ratio and profits. So these birds were cooped up literally their entire lives. They were in such close quarters that they couldn't lift a single wing. They were bred to be morbidly obese, such the equivalent to if a human infant was at this scale, they would, um, by the age of three months, weigh over 600 pounds. The chickens were so large that they couldn't walk. They would sit in their own feces and the feces of generations of birds before them because they only cleaned the facilities every few years. So there was just this pile of manure on top of the concrete. Their feathers would fall off. They were abjectly sick. And he hated it. But this is what he had to do because this is the norms of the industry. And if he treated them better, he would cut into profits and he wouldn't stay afloat and he couldn't pay back the debt he'd incurred setting up the system in the first place. Then he saw an ad with Jim Perdue on television in which Jim Perdue was talking about how the chickens and their operations were happy and healthy. And Craig just, his BS meter went off and he said, I'm no psychologist, but I know these birds aren't happy. I'm no vet, but I know these birds aren't healthy. 
And so this guy is lying, and I, if I don't say something, then I'm lying too. And so he decided to um, take a rather bold step. He invited Compassion and World Farming to come in with video cameras at his invitation to capture the, the uh, actual reality at his award-winning chicken farm. And they uh, captured the images of all the birds lying in poop and unable to walk, and 5% of them were dead. And that's the reality. 5% die before they even reach slaughter. And he showed the world what was going on behind the scenes. And the video went viral. Purdue was not happy. Before long, Mr. Watts had uh, retired from the chicken farming business. He was growing row crops on his, on his farm, and he took on the job helping factory farmers to transition to healthier directions. Craig's a hero to me. He's a simple North Carolina chicken farmer who has a backbone and has a conscience and has ethics and integrity, and he took a bold risk to tell us the truth. I'm grateful to him. I'm grateful to everyone else who's stepping up and speaking the truth. Chickens today are raised in horrendous conditions. It's not something I ever want to support with my dollars or take into my body. The good news is I don't have to, and neither do you. How are hens raised that produce eggs? Modern um, uh, layer hens, as they're called by the industry, that produce eggs are treated horrendously. They have less than one square foot per bird. They're often in cages with like five birds at a time. They, they're driven crazy. They're on wire or slatted cages, so their poop falls on the heads of the birds below, uh, along with their eggs that, that are you know, set to drop into a certain direction. They, they are um, driven so crazy that they try to peck each other to death. So the industry's response is to cut off their beaks so that they can still try, but they won't succeed. Uh, to me, um, the, the abuse of the layer hens is horrendous, and it's one of the reasons why I will choose never to eat uh, factory farmed eggs. How are cows raised who are raised to produce milk? In the state of California, where I live, there was a Happy, Happy Cows campaign from the California Milk Board. They ran ads. They, they showed images of cows in lush green fields with phrases like, so much grass, so little time. And happy milk comes from happy cows. Happy cows come from California. It was a lovely ad campaign. The only trouble was that the images of the cows on grass were actually filmed in New Zealand. The state of California, most of the dairy operations are concentrated in the Central Valley of California, which is fairly barren. And the animals live on concrete or barren dirt, and they never see a blade of grass in their entire lives. They're cooped up in very small quarters. Uh, one of the most painful things to me about the milk industry is that baby calves are ripped away from their mothers at uh, one day old or less. So the moms never get to nurse their babies, and they cry. They cry and cry for their babies. And what mother wouldn't to have their baby ripped away so early? And then their milk is taken for humans. And they are kept constantly lactating, so that with, often with drugs and, and violations of their natural instincts, as well as breeding methods. They keep them in that state, and so their udders are huge and swollen and often become infected. And these poor cows are, are pretty miserable. They're four-legged milk pumps, essentially, or that's how they're treated. But of course, they're mammals, and they love their young just like any mom does. And they deserve to have their babies with them, I think. But humans want all the milk for themselves. So, you know, it's a sad system, and um, it's also creating a product, milk, that doesn't really do a body good. It's, it's great for baby cows. In fact, it's nature's most perfect food for baby cows, but not for humans. We're the only species that drinks the milk of another species, and we're the only species that drinks any milk after infancy. And uh, yes, milk is packed with certain nutrients. It's, it's got everything that you need. To, it, it's really baby cow growth fluid, and it's designed to help uh, an animal to double its birth weight in 47 days, and that animal also happens to have, I believe, four stomachs. So um, that's, if you want to double your birth weight in 47 days, then you know, drink lots of milk. But the reality is that it's also packed with hormones, it's, it's, um, which is understandable since it's coming from an animal that is often pumped full of hormones, but that's also a lactating mammal. And those hormones can throw off our hormonal balance and, um, and are therefore linked to higher rates of cancer. Is it okay to eat animals if they're organic, grass-fed, or free-range? I have a lot of respect for human, every human being's need to clarify for themselves what their own values are, what their own ethics and integrity is, what their health needs are. You are the only expert on you on the entire planet. 
Just because a lot of studies have shown that something is good for most people most of the time doesn't mean it's okay for you. And you have to decide what are your ethics and your values and what's in alignment with them. Um, many people decide to go 100% vegan because of ethical reasons or for health reasons or for environmental reasons. I respect that, absolutely. That can be a wonderful choice for a lot of people. Some cho people choose to include a small amount of pasture-based animal products in their diet for various reasons, or, and, and in some cases I can think that makes sense for them too. At the end of the day, you have to decide what makes sense for you, but, but here's what we know. The more animal products we eat, statistically, the more likely we are to suffer and die from diseases like heart disease and cancer and type 2 diabetes and dementia, the more our, we're going to have an ecological footprint that's larger and it's going to lead to faster climate change, less topsoil and less water for future generations, and the more animals are going to die for human consumption. So whether you choose to go to zero or 5% or 10% or whatever, know that pasture-raised is definitely more humane and more sustainable and more healthy than industrialized meat. And know that uh, there's an impact every choice we make. And you get to decide what kind of impact you want to make that's in keeping with your values. And I want to help you to make that a conscious one. What made you write your last book? I wrote 31 Day Food Revolution because I want to put the power in your hands where it belongs to create change, to create health, and to, to participate in building a healthier world. Part one and two focus on detoxifying and nourishing our bodies. Part three focuses on how we can gather our tribe and our community and build healthy social relationships that are rooted in healthy food. And then part four is transform, and that's where we look at how we can be part of the revolution, how we can change the world. I say we need to put our own oxygen mask on first before helping others, and then we need to save the freaking plane because we got some big problems on the planet and toxic food is fueling a lot of them. And the spoiler alert is that it is a heck of a lot easier to change the world than you probably ever imagined. The core, the core principles of the Food Revolution diet plan are to eat less sugar and processed junk, eat less animal products, particularly if they come from factory farms, eat more whole plant foods, and source consciously things like organic, fair trade, local, non-GMO, these things matter, and I show how and why. Um, and ultimately, it's all about helping you start wherever you are and move towards wherever you want to be so you can get the results you want for your health and for your life. What impact does eating animal products have on the soil? Topsoil is life. It's the source of all of our food. It's precious, it's sacred, it's beautiful, and it is threatened. United Nations researchers estimate that by the year 2050, we may have half the arable farmland that we did in 1960, and yet we'll have a lot more people to feed. So population goes up, topsoil goes down, that's not a pretty picture. And we need topsoil, but we are eroding it, and livestock production is at the center of that because unsustainable farming practices are fueling topsoil erosion, and often they are fueled by the need to produce as much yield as possible in the shortest possible amount of time. Guess why we need such a big yield? Because we're feeding 12 pounds of grain or soy for every pound of feedlot beef we produce. We're feeding four or five pounds for every pound of chicken we produce. And all of that waste is putting enormous pressure on our cropland. So we're pumping it full of pesticides and artificial fertilizers and fungicides, all of which are eroding the health and vitality of the soil so that we can produce maximal yield in the shortest possible amount of time. It's dangerous and it's terrifying when you think about the implications. That's why I think we need to move towards more organic, more sustainable food production methods. And we can afford to do that when we stop wasting most of our grain and soy by cycling it through livestock. What impact does eating animal products have on the amount of pesticides sprayed? Over half of our agricultural land in North America is being used in livestock production. And a lot of that is cropland that's growing grain or soy to feed livestock. Guess what? A lot of that grain or soy is genetically engineered and is being sprayed with pesticides as well as herbicides. So if you want to spare our land and our water and our air from contamination with herbicides, with pesticides, with fungicides, then one of the top things you can do is to eat less meat. What impacts does eating a what impact does eating animal products have on forests, biodiversity, and species extinction? Years back, Rainforest Action Network decided to take on a company. They wanted to focus on a boycott on one company that the consumer 
could say no to because of its rainforest destructive practices. And they ended up focusing on Burger King. Why? Because they determined that it took about 55 square feet of tropical rainforest to produce every single quarter pound hamburger from rainforest beef. All over the world, rainforests are being chopped down or burned to create grazing land for cattle. This still continues to this day, and um, it is one of the central drivers of climate change. I've worked with indigenous peoples in the Brazilian Amazon who are telling me that there are three main reasons their rainforests are threatened and being destroyed. One is oil exploitation, two is grazing land for cattle, and three is cropland for soybeans particularly. Well, guess where those soybeans end up? Cattle feed. So if you're concerned about the fate of the tropical rainforests, then one of the top things you can do is to meet, eat less meat, particularly eat less red meat. What impact does eating animal products have on antibiotic resistant bacteria? 80% of the antibiotics that are used in the United States today are used not on humans, but on livestock. In Europe, it's 66%. And all of this live, uh, livestock antibiotic use is fueled because factory farms want to make the animals gain weight faster, and antibiotics contribute to that. And they also want to keep them alive under horrendous conditions where sickness could spread very, very rapidly. The problem is that these antibiotics are breeding grounds for antibiotic-resistant bacteria, which are, uh, because the antibiotics are given to livestock with every single dose of feed, the bacteria that can survive that will survive and prosper and spread. So we face an epidemic of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and it threatens the viability of antibiotics for future generations. It killed 30,000 Americans last year. It killed hundreds of thousands of people worldwide last year. The problem threatens to decimate tens of millions of lives annually within the next generation, and it is being fueled centrally by industrialized animal agriculture. Um, so, um, and this, this is pretty terrifying if you think about it. You could say that modern factory farms have become biological weapons factories. They are literally breeding bacteria in them that is killing tens of thousands of us every single year, and that's accelerating. What can we do? Antibiotic-free is one thing. Going plant-based is another. We do not have to participate in that system with our dollars, and we don't have to bring it into our homes. What impact does eating animal products have on water use and water shortages? I live in California. We've got a drought in the state of California. Not right now, but it comes and goes. We're kind of perpetually in a bit of drought because we have 38 million people and not a whole lot of water. Um, we're not alone. Uh, billions of people around the world live in places where there isn't as much water as there is human demand. In places like California and the Middle East and the central United States, um, the Farm Belt, many other parts of the world, um, that's made up for by aquifers, underground water lakes and reservoirs and rivers that are deep down. In most cases, we are pumping those aquifers faster than they're replenishing, which puts us on a collision course with um, massive problems down the road if we can't live within our water means. So let's suppose you're concerned about that. Let's suppose you're concerned about future generations and their ability to have water to drink, to grow food, to wash houses, to, to flush toilets, everything they're going to need. Well, guess what? The, the biggest central driver is going to come back again to livestock production. It takes about 2,500 gallons of water to produce one pound of feedlot beef in the United States today. In the state of California, we use more water for livestock and animal agriculture than we do for all all of the civilian uses, all the swimming pools and toilets and drinking water, and all the business uses and all the government uses combined just for livestock. And we, imp we import most of our meat in the state of California. So um, if you are concerned about water, then one of the top things you can do is to eat lower on the food chain. Now, why are we using all this water for livestock? It's not because cows are really thirsty, although they do drink. It's because, again, it takes 12 pounds of grain or soy to make one pound of feedlot beef. It also takes a lot of water to irrigate pasture, even if the cows are just eating grass, especially in a place like California, where the grass turns brown in the summer unless it's irrigated with groundwater. So, therefore, it, that, that water is going into the livestock eventually and wasting much of it along the way. 
So if you're concerned about water for future generations, eat lower on the food chain. Is it true that your dad was the heir to the Baskin Robbins ice cream empire and that he walked away from it completely and all the money from it in order to pursue his own path? Um, do you think he regrets that decision? And do you regret that he made that decision? My grandfather founded the Baskin Robbins Ice Cream Company, 31 Flavors. My dad, John, grew up with an ice cream cone-shaped swimming pool in the backyard and 31 flavors of ice cream in the freezer. He was groomed from his early childhood to one day join in running the family company. But when he was in his early 20s, he was offered that chance and he said no. And he walked away from a path that was practically paved with gold and ice cream to, as we jokingly say in our family, follow his own rocky road. He ended up moving with my mom to a little island off the coast of Canada. They built this one-room log cabin. They grew most of their own food. They practiced yoga and meditation for several hours a day, and they named their kid Ocean. That's me. They almost named me Kale, but I have to tell you, I'm glad they took the conservative route when they named their son. But we did eat a lot of kale, along with cabbage and carrots and onions and broccoli and other veggies we grew in the garden. Then as my dad got a little uh, older in life, he ended up writing a book called Diet for a New America and becoming one of the leading spokespeople in the world for healthy food for everybody. And millions of people were inspired by his message. And the media called him the rebel without a cone. Here he was. He'd walked away from this ice cream empire to follow his own path and become a spokesperson for health. Uh, so I've been really inspired by my dad's example, and I think he's never looked back with any regret on his choice. It was a choice for integrity. It was a choice for conscience. And it happens to be a choice that's enabled him to help a lot more people than he ever could have helped if he'd focused his life on building or inventing a 30-second flavor. And now here I am, author of 31-Day Food Revolution, and I'm saying that 31 steps to health can bring you more pleasure and more satisfaction even than 31 flavors of ice cream. And I believe that I'm carrying my grandfather's legacy forward by bringing joy and happiness to people, by giving people options for every day of the month, and also uh, I'm taking it to the next level by moving from ice cream to health. And my dad has been such a pioneer in that, and I am so grateful to work with him. People ask, if I'm following in his footsteps, and I say, no, we're leading the charge together. And I'm so grateful to have his partnership in that. Is your grandfather still alive? My grandfather ended up being one of the people who was inspired by my dad's work. He, he had lost his brother-in-law and business partner, Bert Baskin, at the age of 54. And my grandpa, at the age of 71, was kind of on death's door, facing serious heart problems, type 2 diabetes, weight issues, and his doctors told him he didn't have long to live. He'd always eaten the standard American diet plus a double scoop of ice cream on top. And now he was facing the standard American diseases. Um, but his doctors gave him a copy of my dad's book, Diet for New America, and suggested he read it. And amazingly, my grandpa did, and he followed its advice. So he cut way down on sugar. He actually pretty much stopped eating sugar. He gave up ice cream. He stopped eating most animal products, and he started eating a lot more whole plant foods. And he got results, the kind of results that are fairly typical and predictable for people who make these kinds of changes. He uh, got off all of these medications that he was taking. He reversed his diabetes and heart disease symptoms. His golf game improved seven strokes. He lost a lot of excess weight. He felt way better. He lived another 20 more healthy years. When he was in his early 90s, my dad and I were with him on his deathbed. And my grandpa said, you know, said to my dad, when you left Baskin Robbins, I thought you were crazy. And I might have been right, he said. But thank God, some of us have lived long enough to learn a few new things. And then he looked at both of us and he said, I'm so proud of you because you're helping people. And that really matters. And, you know, he's such an inspiration to me because, you know, he, he had a lot of investment in thinking there was no connection between food and health. And he had the courage to make a change. And if he could make that change, then I think there's hope for the rest of us, too. What is wrong with eating animals if they're raised by so-called humane standards? I'm never one to place value judgments and use words like right and wrong when it comes to human choices. Um, but I think that my concern about humane meat, for example, is there's, there's a few of them. One is it's often greenwashing, that the industry will tout something as humane and it may just be a little bit less bad. Uh, they, just because they put happy animals on the package doesn't mean the animals are happy. So you really may want to check out the operation if you're seriously thinking about it. 
Um, but, you know, if you have a neighbor with chickens and they're running around out there, like, that's its own thing. You know, make your own choices about that. But recognize that a lot of what's out there is marketing hype uh, and not necessarily having a lot of substance behind it. Um, the other problem is there are environmental concerns with animal products. And just because an animal lives in a good way doesn't mean it doesn't uh, waste a lot of resources to cycle biomass through it instead of eating it directly. Um, but there are ecosystems where that can make sense, where grass grows and you couldn't grow cropland. And cows could be out there in a sustainable way and they're pooping on the soil. And if it's managed properly, it can be sustainable. It just usually is not. Um, and then there are health concerns because uh, most of us are getting too much animal products in our diets. And you know, 5% of the American population gets the recommended daily allowance for fiber, which is probably set too low. So we all need lots of fiber, a lot more than we're getting. And, um, and there are no, there's no fiber in any animal products. Uh, and fiber is not just good for keeping you regular, it's also what feeds the good bacteria in your gut. Um, so those are some concerns. Um, there are some nutrients that animal products can have that may be a benefit to some people. Um, I think that uh, I'm not one to say that no one should ever, under any circumstances, consume any animal products. I have too much respect for the diversity of ecosystems, values, ethics, uh, life experience, and nutritional realities on this planet to say that. I think you need to listen to your own body, but here's what we see. The blue zones are the places in the world where people live the longest, healthiest lives. Dan Buettner has documented them for National Geographic. There are six of them in Italy and Greece in Loma Linda, California, in Costa Rica, Okinawa, Japan, around the world. And the blue zones are all places where people eat very little animal products, between zero and five or 10%. The average American gets 34% of our calories from animal products. So we could argue till the cows come home, literally, about whether the optimal amount of animal products in the human diet is zero or five or 10%. What I don't think there's a lot of argument about is that it's a lot less than 34%. Why do you say that every time we eat, we're casting a vote? Every bite you take, every dollar you spend on food is a kind of a vote. You're voting for the health you want, and you're voting for the world you want. The question isn't, do you make a difference? It's what kind of a difference are you going to make? What kind of future do you want? And I say, make that vote a conscious one, because when you bring your food choices into integrity with your conscience, with your values, with your life goals and your aspirations, then your life takes on an, a potency, a congruency, and a power that is immense. What are the 10 top action steps people can take to improve our health and the planets and the treatment of all species on the planet? Number one, eat less meat. Number two, move away from sugar and processed junk. Number three, focus on healthy habits that you can sustain in your day-to-day -day life. Plan ahead, shop ahead, shop from lists, cook on weekends so you have an abundance of food and cooking quantity. Number four, build your social network around healthy food. So you can um, have a healthy meal swap with friends or family, make some extra food for the neighbors, that kind of thing. Number five, is shop consciously in your location. So if you can support a farmer's market or community-supported agriculture, that's a great step. If you can support a natural food store, that's also a positive step. Uh, so choose consciously where you shop. It'll help steer you in the right direction, but it'll also be a way to contribute to your ethics and values if you want more local, healthy, strong, vibrant economy, if you want uh, to support healthy farmers doing the right thing for your, yourself and your loved ones if you want to support local businesses. Number six is to, to choose what you buy consciously and to support fair trade and uh, sustainably raised products. Organic in particular is great. Um, these are all, it matters how food's growing, how it's processed, whether it's sprayed with pesticides or not, how animals and farm workers were treated. Number seven is to become a spokesperson. Share books, videos, films with people you love. Let them know, because food is something that we all participate in. And so as you discover more and as you live more, it's natural to want to share it. Number eight is um, 
to become uh, politically active and engaged. You can meet with local school board to talk about the school lunch program. You could meet with a local representative to talk about government subsidies of the farm bill and subsidies of commodities crops and factory farm meat and say that you, as a taxpayer you want to see your money go to things like food for hungry poor people to be able to eat healthy food rather than subsidizing giant agrochemical companies so they can treat animals horribly and get rewarded and lower the price per pound to the consumer. We don't want to subsidize the wrong stuff. Number nine is um, number nine is to saturate your diet with health-giving, fabulous foods that are really good for you. I'm talking mushrooms, greens, healthy spices. These are all wonderful, and they're all going to be foods that when you love them, they will love you back. And number ten is to find recipes you love that are good for you and add them to your starting rotation and share them with people you care about. <clears throat> what are the policies that our government can take that would have the greatest benefit to society and the world? Right now we have a farm bill in which taxpayer money is subsidizing essentially junk food. Wonder Bread, Twinkies has 14 subsidized ingredients in it, subsidizing factory farmed meat, and most of that money isn't supporting fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, the foods we know we should be eating more of. So government could shift that. So it's, if it's going to subsidize anything, it should be the farms that are growing the foods that are helping us be healthy. And then number two, we could increase the food stamp value for fruits and vegetables so that people who are poor, who are dependent on food stamps to survive, can actually afford to eat fruits and vegetables, which is going to create healthier communities. This has been piloted in a few places with the Wholesome Wave program. There's about 500,000 Americans participating right now. And what we're finding is that when people get double value for fruits and vegetables, guess what? They buy and they eat more fruits and vegetables and they get healthier. So this is something we can implement on a mass scale. I'd like to see government investing serious research dollars, not just in agrochemical companies and agrochemical practices, but in organic agriculture. How can we expand yields and expand sustainability? We should be focusing on how we can sequester carbon out of the atmosphere into the soil by sus to sustainable farming. We could actually help take a major bite out of climate change, possibly even reverse it. If we could just take some of that carbon out of the atmosphere, capture it in the soil, and restore our topsoil in the process. Is there any encouraging or good news going on in the food movement? I'm so inspired by what's happening in the food movement right now in the last generation. We've seen a five-fold increase in the number of farmers markets in the United States. Five-fold increase in the number of people participating in community-supported agriculture, or CSA programs, which are buying direct from local farmers. We have seen a, a, about a fourfold increase in sales of organically grown foods in the United States. All over the place, people are rising up and caring how their food's produced, how it's grown, where it comes from, who grew it, and we care about local, and we care about real food instead of processed junk. Sales of sugary breakfast cereal, cereals have been going down. Sales of certified non-GMO foods have gone from nothing to over $25 billion in the last seven years in the U.S. alone. Nine U.S. states have banned gestational crates for mother pigs, and the entire European Union has done likewise. So there are a lot of places where we are making inroads, and we're making change, and we're changing what we eat and what we grow and what restaurants are serving. When I was a kid, you couldn't get whole wheat bread in a supermarket. Now it's all over the place. When I was a kid, you couldn't find tofu or soy milk. Now the question isn't, can you find soy milk? It's, is there hemp milk and almond milk and nut milks of every kind and oat milk? And do they have rice milk? There are so many options emerging because consumers are demanding it and the food industry and the food business and even the farmers are starting to respond. And I think we're just getting started. What do you see as the most important thing about the Real Truth About Health Conference? The Real Truth About Health Conference is giving us the real truth about health. And it's creating a mechanism where some of the top experts and wisdom leaders in the world can share their breakthrough insights widely. And where people all over the world can access it for free. You know, there's so much hucksterism in the natural health space today where there's a secret covert agenda. Even when something is free, it really isn't. The real goal is to push a supplement or an ideology or even some kind of a book or course or something. And, and um, so a lot of us understandably get kind of cynical about it. And we don't know who to trust. 
And I think that profit motive taints agendas and ideologies more than most people would like to admit. And uh, the real truth about health is trying in the midst of that to provide a breath of fresh air and a voice of sanity to say, you know what, let's get to the facts of it. And you know, the experts all come also not being paid for their time because they are also all people who are passionate about the message. And I think it creates a whole new spirit, which is a spirit of generosity and cooperation that we all want because everyone wants to be healthy and everyone wants to participate in building a healthier world, at least the folks who are part of this conference do. And uh, so I love that we get to come together with kindred spirits, learn from leading edge experts, share our wisdom, cross pollinate, and then apply it to get results in our lives. Thank you.